So we're here with Mr. Bonfilio to discuss the recent primary for Rhode Island's 1st Congressional District. My name is Jack Kurt, and I'll be asking Mr. Bonfilio a few questions on the race. Out of the 12 Democratic candidates that were on the ballot and contested in the primary, which did you predict would win the nomination? And out of the Republican candidates, which did you predict would win that party's nomination? Okay, well, of the 12 or so candidates that were running, I really had come to predict, and I made this prediction the night before, I was going with Aaron Regenberg as the, uh, as the likely winner. I really thought that as the most uh, progressive and liberal candidate in the race, that the more moderate candidates, so to speak, would divide up the vote amongst themselves and he would have a clear feel to, to dominate the, uh, the more progressive wing of the party. Um, it turned out that that didn't happen, that uh, one of the moderate candidates kind of pulled away and overtook him. On the Republican side, I didn't think there was any doubt that uh, Mr. Leonard okay, was going to be far and away the, the big winner, and, and he was. <laughs> So the Democratic nominee is Gabe Amo. He entered the race with polling at 3%. He eventually reached second place in polling at 19% just three weeks ago under the front runner Aaron Regenberg, who was leading at 28%. Why do you think Amo won when the latest polling had him nine points behind? And do you think his acceptance of political contributions from lobbyists representing big banks, oil, and pharmaceutical companies, which he has been criticized for, played any role? And I'll take the second part first. Yes, I think that the uh, contributions from those groups played a major role because it allowed him to be up on television, allowed him to run ads on TV, which several of the other candidates were not able to do. So he was able to have television ads, which get his, uh, his profile and his, uh, his face and, and name in front of the voters. Um, why, was, why was he able to win? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. I think that two of the front runners kind of self-destructed. Uh, Sabina Matos, the lieutenant governor, as we may be familiar, uh, had that signature scandal, the nomination papers where she had fraudulent even signatures of dead people, and there's a current attorney general's investigation into that uh, signature scandal, so I think that kind of knocked her out of contention. As far as Aaron Regenberg, I, I think he had some issues also with uh, some contributions from some family members, over $100,000 in contributions, which uh, kind of turned a lot of people off as he was running as the, the progressive candidate and appeared to be more, more wealthy and more out of touch than perhaps uh, he wanted to appear. Um, uh, I would say also that uh, he turned a lot of people off as being too liberal, too progressive, and that they were looking for an alternative. Uh, he had Bernie Sanders come in and campaign for him. He got endorsed by AOC. I think that scared a lot of people. This guy might be a little too radical. Right? They were looking for an alternative. Now, Mr. Amo was up on television. Uh, he had done a decent job of uh, speaking for himself in, in the debates that were televised on both channels 10 and 12. He appears likable. He has experience. He's worked for both Presidents Obama and Biden, as well as Governor Raimondo. Uh, he, he's well-spoken. Uh, he was more moderate. And I think when people were moving off Regenberg, they found a home there. And of course, the, the money that he had allowed him to advertise and uh, allowed him to be the choice of those more moderate voters. So switching to the other side for a minute, in the Republican primary, political newcomer Jerry Leonard, he defeated Middletown town council member Terry Flynn. Do you think right. Leonard's status as an outsider represents the current electorate of the Republican Party, and could it benefit him in the general election against Democrat Amo, as you said, a longtime political strategist that has worked in the administrations of both Barack Obama and Joe Biden? Yes. Uh, well, I think the, the Republican Party is willing to turn at this point in Rhode Island to whatever candidates they think have a chance of being elected, whether they be outsiders or more experienced candidates. I think this gentleman has a good persona. He has a good profile. He's a career military man. I think they feel that that might be appealing to, to certain segments of the electorate. Um, do I think that he's going to have much of a chance to defeat the Democrat Amo? No, I don't. I think that right now the Republican brand in this state is uh, too tainted. Okay, We're a blue state. We're a democratic state. We're a liberal state. Um, 
I think the Republican already starts at a serious disadvantage, especially in that district, which is very heavily Democratic, was represented by David Cicilline for the last dozen years or so. Uh, I really think that in the age of Trump, the Republican even has a more difficult, a more difficult uh, uh, chance getting elected because Rhode Islanders, by and large, are, are not pro-Trump. So I, I would expect Mr. Leonard to get blown out <laughs> in this race in, no, in November. Yeah. So I want to go back to something you mentioned a few minutes ago. In July, election officials discovered fraudulent signatures on Lieutenant Governor Sabina Matos's campaign petition, including those of voters that had been dead for several years. Additional instances of irregularities were later found, including the signatures of voters who told police that they never signed Matos's petition. An investigation by the Attorney General and the Rhode Island Board of Elections reviewing the authenticity of her petition signatures is ongoing. If the validity of Matos's petition to run is under an ongoing investigation, should she have been disqualified from running in the first place? It's a good question, Jack. Should she have been disqualified? You're looking for my opinion? I would say no. Uh, the law says you need 500 valid signatures. Okay. The Board of Elections originally stated that they would not do a review of every one of her signatures, but then they changed course and did so. And in doing so, they found that she had a cushion of at least 200 signatures towards the 500 that she needed. So since she met the criteria of the law, I think she should have stayed on the ballot. So our last question, uh, the first congressional district, as you mentioned, it's overwhelmingly Democratic. Despite this, average polling shows that the party's current leader, President Joe Biden, has an average net disapproval rating among Rhode Island voters. Do you think there will be any other surprises in this election for a district that has not elected a Republican since 1992? I'm afraid not, as far as surprises. Un unless there comes to be some sort of a major scandal that taints AMO. I think he will cruise to victory. It's just a very strongly Democratic district. And they've elected David Cicilline several times. I think he had six terms in that district. Um, the Republican is unknown. He has very little money with which to advertise. Uh, I was reading the other day that people who have looked at his campaign website, there's nothing much there. Uh, I just don't think that he's going to be able to break through. He's going to have to, I mean, if Alan Fung, could not win as a Republican in the second district, which is more evenly matched, and he, he, who had a higher profile and a greater favorability than this unknown candidate, I don't see how Mr. Leonard, absent some major scandal on AMO, is going to be able to break through. I don't think Joe Biden is going to hurt him in that district. It's just, just too democratic for, for that to happen. All right, that's all the questions we have. I want to thank Mr. Bonfilio for appearing with us today. I thank him for taking our questions, and I thank you for watching. Thank you for having me.